Well, good morning, New Life. So good to have all of you with us today. I hope it's been a great Sunday for you so far, and uh, we're just glad you're here joining us. Whether you're here in person or watching online, it's going to be a great day. Sunday's always one of my favorite days because I get to hang out with all of you people. So thanks for being here. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and starting in verse 19, where the title of the message today is Removing the Training Wheels. Removing the training wheels. Now, uh, I remember uh, this was probably three or four, maybe more years ago, maybe five years ago, my son coming up to me and talking to me about wanting to remove the training wheels from his bike. We started this conversation, and he became convinced that if he could remove the training wheels from his bike, he'd be able to ride a whole lot faster. He'd be able to take longer bike rides because he wasn't carrying the extra weight, and he'd be able to do like tricks and other things that he couldn't do when those training wheels were stuck on. And so we're like, all right, let's do this. And so we take out his bike, we take the training wheels off and, and, uh, we start the process of getting him, you know, he's four years old or something like that, learning to ride his bike without his training wheels. Now, <clears throat> We start off at first, and as you can imagine, like any one of us would have been as kids, uh, you take the training wheels off, and all of a sudden you're a little nervous because those training wheels, they provide stability, right? They're going to make it make you sure that you don't just fall over. They provide stability. There's a source of comfort, a source of security and safety in those training wheels. So when you just take them off, it can seem a little bit intimidating. And so we start off, and I grab the back of the seat of his uh, bike, and I'm like, all right, buddy, get on. I'm not going to let you just tip over. This is going to be okay, all right? And so he gets on. He's a little nervous, but he's ready to go. And so he starts pedaling down the sidewalk or the parking lot. I don't remember where we were, but he starts pedaling down there, and I'm trying to kind of jog to keep up with him, and and, uh, he's making sure, okay, I'm good. I'm safe. I'm I'm going to be good. And so we do this over and over and over again, and soon uh, my grip starts to loosen up a little bit on the seat, and he notices this, and he's like, Dad, where'd you go? And I said, I'm still here. I'm not going to let you fall. You're going to be okay, all right? And so we're still going, we're still going. And eventually we get to the point where I'm not even really holding his seat. I've just got my hand touching it. He's doing it by himself. He just maybe doesn't quite realize it yet. And so we're going, we're going. And eventually he starts pedaling his bike fast enough where I can't keep up with him anymore because I can't run like this very fast, you know? And so he's, he's pedaling his bike faster than I can, than I can run. And so I just let go and start jogging behind him and he's going along. And all of a sudden he realizes what's happening. He stops. He's like, Dad, you let go. And I said, yeah, but you didn't need me to hold on. You got this, right? You, you, you've got this. And so it took a little bit more practice for him to learn to start and stop and turn and do all of that. But from that moment on, he was so excited because he could ride his bike faster. And almost every day I would come home from work or wherever I was, and he'd be like, Dad, let's go on a long bike ride because he could go on long bike rides then now that he didn't have his training wheels on. He was so excited. He was ready to get rid of those training wheels, even though it meant getting rid of what was giving him stability, what was making him comfortable, what was helping him feel safe, he knew that they were holding him back. And I think the same thing is true of us as followers of Jesus sometimes. I think there are things that God wants to do in our lives, things that God wants to do through us that that are incredible, things that are greater things than we've ever imagined before. But if we're going to get from here to there, we've got to be willing to let go of the training wheels. We've got to be willing to step out of our comfort zone, to step out of a place where we feel stable, where we feel secure, where we feel safe, and be willing to step out in faith and believe that as we go, God's not just going to leave us to crash on our own, but he's going to be with us every step of the process. And as we think about this, as we think about these great things that I believe God has in store for you, for me, for our church, I believe that it's important that we recognize that in order to get there, We've got to be willing to take the training wheels off. Last week, we talked about this foundational message that we need to be sold out to. We need to be singularly focused on as a church. If we're going to see God do everything he wants to in and through each one of us, that's the message of Jesus, the message of the gospel. If you weren't here last week, we summed that up by saying, Jesus came, he died for you, he conquered death, and he can change your life. We live in a world where there's all kinds of messages coming in, political messages, uh, materialistic messages, messages about relationships or things we need to buy or how we need to live or stuff we need to do. But as a church, we don't need to let any of those messages drive us. 
And as followers of Jesus, we don't want any of those messages to drive us. More than anything else, at the foundation for us needs to be the message of Jesus. That he came, he died, he conquered death, and he can change your life. Now, with that as our foundation, we also have to recognize something. That that message isn't something for us to just hear, for us to receive, for us to let it change me, and then sit in our chair at church and go, okay, let's just ride this out until I die. That's not what it's about. In fact, Jesus, when he came and he died on the cross, before he ascended back into heaven, he went to his disciples and he said, this mission that I've been on, this mission of helping people discover who I am and discover God's love and grace and mercy for them, this message that he summed up, that he came not to be served, but to serve and to give, this mission to seek and save those who were lost, Jesus said, this mission is now being handed off to his disciples. And Jesus calls all followers of Jesus to join in on the mission with him. You see, I believe this morning that a church that reaches people is a church that honors Jesus. And if we want to be a church, I'm not just talking about a building. I'm not just talking about a Sunday morning service. I'm talking about each one of us as individuals, as a community of faith. If we want to be a church that honors Jesus, then we have to be a church that takes seriously the mission of Jesus to reach out to others. And we know this mission one of the most famous passages of Scripture, the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, 19, Jesus sums it up in this way. He says, Therefore, go therefore into all the world, make disciples of all nations, teaching them, or excuse me, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. This is the the great commission. We've heard this. If you've been in church, you've heard this a thousand times. Go, make disciples, baptize them, teach them to obey everything. And, And here's the key. He says, when you take off the training wheels and you step out in faith and you trust that God's gonna be with you as you go, he says, and behold, I am with you always as you go. You see, being used by God, Allowing God to do the incredible things that he wants to do in and through each one of us is going to stretch us outside of our comfort zone. Being a part of the mission of God is going to require at some point that we let go of the things that are keeping us comfortable and making us feel stable and all those kinds of things. And we step out in faith, believing that as we go, Jesus is going to meet us in those places. And as we go we know that he's going to use us in incredible ways because he's going to go with us. So this morning I want to talk to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and I want to go back to a guy we talked about last week. That's the Apostle Paul. Now, if you were with us last week, you might remember we talked about Paul. We said Paul was this man that that, uh, at first early on was not about Jesus. He didn't like Jesus. He thought Jesus was a fraud. He thought he was just some other teacher. He just, he didn't want to have anything to do with that. And in fact, he was so opposed to Jesus that he persecuted followers of Jesus. He tried to stop the movement of Jesus from being able to go forward. But in a dramatic moment on a trip to Damascus where he's he's getting ready to arrest and gather up and persecute more followers of Jesus, he meets with Jesus in a powerful way. And Jesus changes and transforms his life. And now he goes from being one of the, one of the main opponents, one of the main enemies of the church, persecuting followers of Jesus to being one of its greatest champions. He goes and he receives Christ into his life. And as his life moves forward, he becomes one of the greatest missionaries in all of history. He leads people to Jesus. He starts churches. He does incredible things for God. So today I want to talk to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 about what does it take to be a church that reaches people. And the reason I want to talk from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is because I think the Apostle Paul, who wrote this, can speak with some authority on what it takes to reach people. When you see the transition he's gone through in his life. So Paul starts off in verse 19. He says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. So Paul starts off in this verse, in verse 19. He says, I'm free from all. In other words, Paul says, I I came into faith in Jesus, and I gave my life to him. I committed to him. Now, Paul at that point had a choice. 
He could have responded in different ways. Of course, Jesus did an incredible thing in him. But at that point, Paul has to realize this whole life that he lived before, persecuting the church, he'd grown up in the Jewish religion and, and he knew all the religious rituals and rites and, and he'd, he'd grown up as a man of respect in that place. He had relationships and connections. What would all these people think now that Paul was a Christian? And it could have been easy for Paul to say, Jesus, I'm thankful for what you've done for me. Now I kind of want to just fade into the background and live a quiet life and and know that I'm going to heaven, but I don't want to get too aggressive. I don't want to get too out there because what about all these other people? What are they going to think? What are they going to say about me? What are they going to talk about when they talk about me? You know, I persecuted the church. What if they come after me now? Paul was free to make that kind of decision. But he says, though I was free to do that, I didn't do that. I chose instead to make myself a servant. I chose instead to step in and say, Jesus, what you've done in me, I know you can do in others. And I want to be used by you to make that happen in some people's lives. So he says, though I, though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all. Why? Because I want to win more people. I want more people to know the hope and the truth and the power of Jesus in their lives. So when we ask the question, what does it take to be a church that reaches people? I think the first thing it takes is what Paul shows us here, and that's a willingness to get involved. That's a willingness to personally make the decision to say, God, I want you to use me to do this. Here's a reality. As a pastor, I work here at the church. This is my job. And, and, and it can be easy for us to think, well, church is what happens on Sunday mornings. It's what happens in this building. And so leading people to Jesus and helping more people discover Jesus, that's the pastor's job. That's maybe the board's job or the staff's job. That's their job to do that. And, 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 and let me tell you, that is part of our job. We all have a part to play in that. But can I tell you this? We will never be as effective in making the impact that God wants to make in this community, in this area, in this state and around the world if we leave it just to the leaders of a church to reach people. Paul had to make a decision that he wasn't going to step back and just receive and get what he wanted. He had to make a decision to say, I'm going to get personally involved. And if we're going to be the kind of church that reaches out to people, that makes an impact for Jesus, that has eternal significance, We've got to be a church that's filled with people that say, Jesus, I want to get personally involved. Use me, God. If you remember, if you were with us this long ago, about a year ago, before COVID and before all the craziness of 2020, we had a series that we went through that was called Plus One. And we talked about how we wanted to be a plus one church, a church where we were always making room for one more person. We were always seeking opportunities to reach one more person for Jesus, to help one more person discover who he is, to help one more person know the hope that Jesus has. Can I tell you this morning that if we're going to be a plus one church, and that's still the heart, and that's still the vision, and that's still the desire, we will never become that kind of church unless we have a congregation, a group of people who come along and say, I'm going to take personal responsibility for making this happen. I know that I have a part to play. I have something that God wants to use me to do if we're going to bring the hope of Jesus into all of our communities. We have to be willing to get involved. But Paul continues on in verse 20. He says this, and this is interesting. He says, to the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. Now, Paul's what he's talking about here is he's saying, to the Jewish religious people who had all these religious customs and rituals and things that Paul was well acquainted with because he grew up in it. He said, to those people... I was going to step in and I was going to adopt some of their customs. I was going to adopt some of their approaches, some of their their mindset about things. Not because I was trying to compromise on the truth of Jesus. That wasn't it at all. He says, I was adopting those things so that I could find common ground with these people, so I could build a bridge of relationship to them, so that I could point them to Jesus. 
so that I could bring Jesus into that situation. He continues on in verse 21, to those outside the law, so not to Jewish people or religious people, but to people who didn't consider themselves religious. He says, to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. So in other words, he's saying, now to people who weren't religious, I, I, I went to try to reach them. And I didn't just I didn't just throw off all restraint and say, well, I can do whatever I want, and I can sin, and I can do all this stuff just because because I want to make a connection with them. He says, no, I was still under the law of God. I was still, I was still trying to follow Jesus, but I did the same thing with them as I did with the Jewish people. I tried to build common ground with them. I tried to build a bridge to them to find a place where we could connect so I could have a connection, a relationship with them so that I could bring Jesus into their situation. He says, In verse 22, to the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. You're starting to get the idea here. Who likes to be weak? I don't think any of us, I know certainly not myself, wouldn't choose to be weak because that sounds more fun. But Paul says, no, 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 to the weak, I didn't didn't come to them saying, I'm strong and I'm going to make you follow me. He says, no, to the weak, I became weak so I could identify with them, so I could build common ground with them, so that they might come to know Jesus. He says this, I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. Paul says, whoever was in my life, whoever I was crossing paths with, I was doing whatever I could to find common ground, to build a relationship with them, to build bridges towards them so that I could bring Jesus into their lives. In other words, if you think about this, if this was Paul's perspective, it meant that he had to lay down a lot of things. If he was going to be around Jewish people, he had to forget how did he feel about their customs or what were his personal opinions or preferences about those things. And he said, no, what's most important is that they come to know Jesus. So I'm going to adopt some things naturally. I'm going to adopt some things on myself. Rather than expecting them to come and be like me, I'm going to find common ground with them so that I can bring Jesus into their situation. To those who weren't under the law, the non-religious people. He says, I wasn't going to come with them and say, you better clean yourself up and you better get right and you better dress right and think right and all this kind of stuff. Otherwise, no, he said, I came and I built common ground with those people, not just sinning or not just throwing off all restraint, but building common ground so that I could bring Jesus into their situation. To the weak, he says, "I, I lowered myself. Being weak isn't fun. He says, I lowered myself to become building common ground with them so that they might find Jesus. The second thing I think we see in this passage is that if we want to be a church that reaches people, if we want to be a follower of Jesus that, that's being effective in the mission he's giving us, one of the things we need to be willing to do is we need to be willing to give sacrificial effort. Paul laid down his own preferences. Paul laid down his own opinions Paul laid down his own comfort. Paul laid down all these things so that through him others might see Jesus. Can I tell you this morning that if we want to be a church that reaches people, then we need to be willing to say, God, not my preferences of music or what things look like or how we do this or how we do that. God, not my preferences, but whatever we can do to build a bridge to those who need to know you. God, not my opinion. I want to speak boldly the truth of your word, the foundation of the gospel, but I want to step into situations with that as the core reality, and I want that to be the main thing, not not my thoughts or my approach or my opinions in that. I want Jesus to be the main thing, and I want to step in to that, sacrificing whatever I need to to bring that message forward. Paul says, I was willing to lower myself, becoming weak, I was willing to make myself uncomfortable. I was willing to step outside of what was normal for me, what my preference, what my opinion, what my desire was. I did it all so that I could do all things. I could become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might reach some of them with the hope of Jesus. If we want to be a church that reaches people, we've got to adopt that mindset. 
We've got to be willing to give sacrificially. We've got to be willing to get to the point where we get on the bike and we say, you know what? The training wheels feel comfortable. They provide stability. They provide security. They provide something I feel like is, is keeping me safe. But maybe it's time God's saying, let's take off some of the training wheels. Let's, let's take that off and believe that as you take those things off, you're going to be able to go further. You're going to be able to go places you've never been before because God is going to go with you and you're not going to be held back by things that are of secondary or lesser importance than Jesus and Jesus himself. Let's not let anything get in the way of somebody coming to Jesus. My hope, my goal, whenever whenever I talk to somebody who's not a Christian, who's not a follower of Jesus, is that they wouldn't be offended by me. That I would do everything I can to lay aside my thoughts, my preferences, my opinions. I do everything I can to lay aside myself and give them Jesus. Now, if they're offended by Jesus, that's not something I'm going to change because the truth of the gospel has to be our foundation. But if I can say, you know what, I really prefer to dress this way, but that, that builds, a, builds a wall, or I really prefer to listen to this kind of music, but that builds a wall. I really prefer to do this kind of thing or that kind of thing, but those build walls instead of building bridges. If I lay aside those things and say I'm going to do whatever I can to build bridges, so that I can bring Jesus into the situation. That's what we got to do if we're going to be a church, if we're going to be people that make an impact for him. Now, Paul continues on in verse 23. He says, I do all this, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. Paul says, I do all of this because I've experienced the hope of Jesus. Paul says, I've, I've experienced the transforming power of Jesus. Paul says, Jesus has done incredible things in me. Paul says, I know the love of Jesus in my life, and I do all these things. I, I lay down my rights. I become uncomfortable. I get stretched outside of my comfort zone. I lay aside my preferences. I do all of these things because I want those people who haven't experienced what I've experienced to know it in their lives. I want to share the hope. I want to share the love. I want to share the peace. I want to share the the power of Jesus with another person. I do all of these things. I lay aside, I sacrifice my preferences so that I can share what I've received with others. Paul in this shows that fundamental to being able to reach people for Jesus is that we can't have a selfish attitude. We can't look to ourselves and think about what we want. But beyond that, even even in those areas, Paul says, I need to look past those things and I need to recognize that, you know, the natural pull of life is just to be about me and what I'm doing. The natural pull for all of us is just to think about my schedule and where I got to drop kids off here and I got to get to work on time and I got to pick up groceries at the store. I got to fill the vehicle up with gas. I got to do this, this, this. Our natural pull is just to look at what's going on here. But Paul says if we want to be a a church, if we want to be people that make an impact, we need to develop this attitude of, God, I want to share what I've been given with others. I want to share the power of Jesus that has made all the difference for me with others. I want others to be able to experience it. If we're going to be a church that reaches people, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus that makes an impact, then you've got to have a heart for people. You've got to have a heart for people. Some people, you may look at their lives if they don't know Jesus and go, man, their life is a mess. They, they, they're living in all kinds of craziness and they're dealing with all kinds of consequences of decisions they've made and there's darkness and there's hopelessness. And we may look at that and say, wow, I really hope they find Jesus, but I don't want to get involved because I don't want to be involved in that mess. No, we got to have a heart for people enough to say, you know what? I can't imagine, imagine the pain, the heartache, the difficulty, the challenge that they're going through. And Jesus has given me something that can make all the difference. Why would I not want to step in and help them to experience? It might get messy. It might make your life more complicated. But imagine the difference Jesus could make. For others, maybe there's some people who, who aren't following Jesus in your life and 
and their life doesn't seem like a mess. In fact, their life seems pretty good. Like they've got a good job. They've got a good family, got a nice house, got a new car, got whatever, you know, and they've got everything seems put together on the outside. And you're thinking, well, their life seems pretty good. You know what the Bible tells us? The Bible tells us that Jesus said he came to give us life and life to the full or life more abundantly. What that means is that we cannot live our best possible life apart from Jesus. And our heart for people should say, you know what? For somebody who's looking at things where they think they're satisfied in this world and everything's good and they think they've got everything they need to have, we need to have a heart for them to say, but God has so much more. We've got to get our eyes off of ourselves and our own schedule and our own thing and instead look to others and say, God, how do you want to use me to make a difference in the lives of others? We've got to have a heart for people. Paul then closes off this train of thought <clears throat> in verse, starting in verse 24 with a picture that he gives to kind of illustrate how he's, how he's lived his life in this way. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. What Paul says is this. He says, picture this like you're an athlete. And if an athlete wants to be successful, if you want to be good, if you want to win the game, win the championship, if you want to go to the Super Bowl or whatever it is, be in the Olympics, then guess what? You're not going to end up there by accident. You're going to make intentional choices that lead you on a path to get where you want to go. So an athlete is going to eat different kinds of food. They're going to adopt a different kind of diet. They're going to exercise. They're going to train. If you're in basketball or football or things like that, you're going to watch hours and hours of film on your opponents and learning their tendencies. You're going to, you're going to spend hours in practice. You're going to make yourself uncomfortable. You're going to make your body uncomfortable. You're going to get sore. You're going to push your body to its limit. Why? Because your goal is to be a successful athlete, to win the championship, to be in the Super Bowl, to make the Olympics, whatever it is. If that's your goal, you're going to make sacrifices in order to get there. And Paul says, athletes do this so that they can receive a temporary prize, a perishable wreath, he talks about. In Paul's day, when, when runners ran in some of the big games that are like the Olympics or whatever, a racer was running, the winner would get a, a crown of olive leaves that they would put on them. But Paul's saying, that's going to die. That's going to pass away. An athlete, yes, they might win the championship. They might get the gold medal or the trophy or whatever. But eventually, that only has temporary impact. Paul says, these people discipline themselves. These athletes change their whole lives so that they can pursue a goal that has temporary benefit. How much more should we as followers of Jesus who recognize the life-changing power that he has, who recognize the eternal impact he can make for me and he can make for others, how much more should we order our lives, should we live our lives with intentionality in such a way that we might lead people to Jesus and help them to experience the ultimate prize that there is? Paul says at the end of this, he says, I discipline my body. He says, I don't run aimlessly. Uh, I do not box as one beating the air. He says, if we're going to be a, a people that are going to reach others for Jesus, if we're going to be effective in this, it's not going to happen by accident. We have to make intentional choices. We have to make intentional decisions about how we operate as a church, about how we operate as individuals in our lives. He says, we got to be intentional about this. And he says, I do all this. I discipline my body. I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. What's the prize that Paul is moving towards here? Well, first and foremost, it's the prize of knowing that at one point, someday, I'm going to be face to face with Jesus for all of eternity in his presence where there's no weeping or pain or sin or darkness or brokenness. But Paul recognizes this. That's only part of the prize. The other part of the prize is that I get to bring others along with me. 
The other part of the prize is that, is that as I faithfully live for Jesus and as I proclaim him and as I point others to him and as others come along with me, there's a greater joy, there's a greater prize in store for me as I bring others along the journey. So Paul says, I'll do whatever it takes because I don't want to, I don't want to settle for anything less than God's best for my life. I don't want to settle for any lesser prize of comfort or of temporary pleasure or of my preference. I don't want to settle for any lesser prize prize than God's best for me. If we're going to be the kind of church that reaches people, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus that's effective for the mission of God in your life, then it's going to require intentional focus. You're not going to end up there on accident. You're not going to get there one day and go, cool, we're here. I didn't know how that happened. Like an athlete, we got to make intentional decisions we got to train ourselves. we got to be intentional about how we live our lives so that we can be about what we think is most important. And if we think living for Jesus and spreading his, the truth of who he is to the world around us is what's most important, then we need to make intentional decisions and we need to intentionally live our lives in such a way where that comes into focus for each one of us, for us as a church. Now you hear all this and... Maybe you say, well, this sounds good. You know, I love this idea that, that God could use me to make a difference. I love this idea that, that God could do something significant. I love, I love the thought process of all of this, but where do I start? I don't know how to do this. I'm shy. I'm uncomfortable. I, I don't see these opportunities. I don't know where they're coming from. I don't know how to do this. I don't know what this even looks like to live it out in real life. I've never led somebody to Jesus. I don't know how to do it. Can I give you a really easy starting point today? That easy starting point is to pray. Pray. Ask God to give you this kind of heart. Ask God to open your eyes to the opportunities that are around you, the people that you're crossing paths with, the people that he's bringing into your life, that you can shine the hope of Jesus into your life. Ask God to put people on your heart that you can pray for. Ask God to lead the way. And I can guarantee you this, if you pray in that way, God will answer that prayer. He will. Because it's his heart, the Bible says, not that any should perish, but that all should come to know the hope and the truth of Jesus. So my challenge for each one of us today is to get in on this mission and to start by praying for opportunities to reach people for Jesus. If you will take that commitment, if you will pray for opportunities to reach people for Jesus in your life, then God's going to start to open your eyes to opportunities. He's going to start to open your eyes to the, to the chance that you get to, to talk to your neighbor, to talk to the person on the street. He's going to open your eyes op to opportunities that you can step in and give to somebody in need or to be a blessing to somebody in some way. He's going to give you, open your eyes to opportunities where you can speak about what Jesus has done for you. We need to pray for those opportunities. And as we pray, I know God will answer that prayer. If we're going to be a plus one church, to go back to that, if we're going to be a church that reaches people, that makes an impact for all of eternity, that doesn't just sit here in a comfortable seat and say, well, I'm just here because this is what I'm supposed to do. And I'm just hanging on till I can get to heaven. But it says, God, instead we say, God, you've put me on this earth. You've put me here for a reason and for a purpose, and I want my life to count for you. If we're going to live that kind of life, then we've got to make intentional choices to live that kind of life. We've got to have a heart for others that compels us to go to them with the good news of Jesus. We've got to have uh, the willingness to sacrifice our own preferences, our own desires, our own wants, our own opinions, that people might see Jesus first and foremost. We've got to be willing to say, God, I'm going to make the decision to get personally involved. If we're going to be that kind of church, then we've got to make those kind of decisions. And can I just tell you today, I believe that God has done incredible things in this church. 
over the last almost three years that I've been here now, the hearts of people, the lives of people that I've seen changed by the power of Jesus is incredible. The people that I've seen commit their lives to Jesus and, and truly be changed, are, are they're just miraculous stories. The stories of how God has entered into people's lives at just the right time and met them in just the right way. All of those things are incredible. And I'm thankful to God for each and every one. But can I tell you this? God has more in store. It's time for us to take off the training wheels, to step out of our comfort zone and to say, Jesus, whatever it costs me, whatever it means for me, I want to make those intentional choices to live a life on this earth that counts for eternity, that makes a difference for eternity. Because I believe if we make that decision, God is going to change your life, yes, but he's going to change the lives of people around you. He's going to use you to be a person of influence in this world that makes a difference for all all of eternity. What could it look like if Pier, if Fort Pier, if, if Harold and Highmore and Gettysburg and Agar and Blunt and Oneida and Presho and Vivian and, and Midland and Hayes and Philip and all of these places around it, what would it look like? Imagine if we could get to the point where every single person in every single home, in every single one of those communities knew the reality that Jesus loved them and he cared about them and he was there for them. And what if they knew that if they were seeking that, if they needed hope, they knew somebody from New Life Church that they could go to to find Jesus through them. Imagine what it could look like as we broadcast our services online and people tune in and watch it. And I know there's some doing that right now. Imagine what it could look like if that started to spread across our state, across our country, around the world. Imagine the impact God could make through you, through me, if we made intentional choices as a church to say, Jesus, we're about you. We're about the gospel. We're about the good news of Jesus. And we're going all in to do everything we can so that we might reach people for you. Imagine the difference God could make in the lives of many people. So today I want to challenge you and I want to invite you to start that journey with me this morning in prayer. Praying for opportunities to say, God, use me praying for God to point out to you the ways that he, he's calling you to make intentional choices, to be willing to sacrifice for the sake of others, the ways that he's calling you to get personally involved, the, to, to open your eyes to the people around you that are hurting or that need hope, that you can, you can enter into those situations with the Spirit of God, empowered by him, knowing that he can make all the difference in their lives. I want to challenge you to start this journey with me this morning. And as we look into our future, I believe the best that God has for your life, I believe the best that God has for New Life Church is still in the future. I believe that God has greater things ahead for us. And that's not because we want to build ourselves up and make ourselves famous and have people look at us and say, wow, they're really cool. That's because we want more people to know Jesus. And at the end of the day, that's what matters most, more than anything else. We want people to know Jesus. We want people's hearts and lives to be transformed by him. So today, will you start that journey with me? Or maybe you're already on that journey. Will you continue that journey with me by starting in prayer today? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the great things that you have done through New Life Church. And I say that not just church as an entity, not just Sunday mornings, not just in this building, but for the great things you've done in and through the lives of each and every person who calls New Life their church home. And God, as grateful as we are for all the things you've done, we know the job isn't finished. We know you still have given us a mission. And the greatest days, I believe, are still yet to come. So God, I pray for each one in this room. I pray for each one who's watching online right now. God, I ask that you would give us your hope. I pray that you would give us your passion and excitement and joy. God, for reaching people, ignite within us a hunger that others may know who you are through us. And God, open our eyes to the opportunities you're giving us. Open our eyes to the, to the chances that you're giving us to step into those places. And God, as those opportunities come, help us to be willing to say yes. 
So Lord Jesus, we give ourselves to you. We commit ourselves to you. We ask for you to do your work in and through us. Now, God, would you empower us by your spirit? Would you anoint us by your spirit as we close in worship and prayer today? Would you come upon us so that we can be effective in doing this in our homes, in our families, in our communities, and all around us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you stand with us as we close in worship? Lord Jesus, this morning we thank you for the great things that you have done in the lives of people in this room, in the lives of people watching online, in the lives of people who call this their church home. God, we're thankful for what you've done. And God, we know that the job isn't finished, that you have more you want to do in us, that you have more that you want to do through us, that you're calling this church to be a church that would make an impact in this community and in the communities around us and across the state and across the country and around the world. God, help us to dream bigger dreams. Help us to take off the training wheels and leave our comfort zones knowing that God, as we go, you go with us and that you can empower us and you can enable us to see great things done for the sake of your kingdom, not so that we can be great, but Jesus, so that you can be glorified in us and through us. So Jesus, empower us, equip us, call us, give us a passion and a hunger to be used by you. And God, when those opportunities come, help us to to step outside of our comfort zone, to sacrifice our preferences, to have the heart to see others, and to make the decision to get personally involved, to say yes. And as we do, God, would you use us? I pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he smile on you and be gracious to you. May he show you his favor and give you his peace. Go in the grace of God. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.